Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Get out my shot, kids. Okay. Back up. Let me fit all your hair in there. Hold on. Okay, so let me just put it as this. Uh, that's a hard question. All right, Ham, what do you, if you could be good at anything instantly, what would you be good at? Reynolds, I'm literally perfect at everything. This is such a difficult question. I'd probably be like good at, you know. Wrestling. <laughs> I'm already a goat at wrestling. I'm already a goat at lacrosse. I'm really good at math. I have so many billions of dollars inside of my bank account. It's just and we're a minute and 23 seconds in. Could you answer the question? I guess I would be good at being bad because I'm so good at everything. Reese, uh, if you could be instantly good at anything, what would it be? I guess it would be uh, communicating better with people. Yeah, man. Good answer. Damn. Good answer. I don't want to give the answer he just gave, but that is definitely the answer I would give. It would probably be maneuvering through... I'm, I'm not even going to just say the stage in life, but life in general. I feel like communication is definitely a part of that, but you know, figuring figuring stuff out on my own. Reynolds, can I redo my like an idiot? No. Yeah. If I could be good at anything, I just want to be good a good lawyer. I just want to help people correctly. Like that's the reason I want to become a lawyer is to you know help people. And your business? It ain't casual. That's it. Good chance. Uh, I'll be good at playing the saxophone because you know I'm gonna be. I'm a good too. jazzy person. Why the saxophone? Uh, ladies, because saxophone jazz. is like, it's like, that's like the sexiest instrument out there. But yeah, at Penn State, there was one person who was playing uh, saxophone and it was great. The talent Just, show. It was at the talent show. It was, it was great. It made me want to play the saxophone. So now I want to be a master at it. All right, hands into part two. Right. Wait, no, wait, no. Everybody no. took that so No, Sheldon, move. No, move. Get wait, wait, can I get Hamzy into part two, please? I, you know what I was part There's a permission slip up there. Part two? Ham wants to go again because he didn't like his first answer because he didn't answer it seriously. And everyone else had a serious answer. You see, I even put on the yellow thing again because, like, we did that in one of my videos. We did that in all yeah, the now, yeah. now I have to go back and dig up that video so I can. Yep, put the clip in. Yep. How do you like that scarf I gave you today? I, I feel like the black Ukage out here. I don't. I don't know what that means. Your mom watches these videos, doesn't she? Yeah, my mom watches these videos. Hi, mom. Hi, mom, yet again, you know, the usual. If I could be good at anything instantly, it would probably be. All right, all right, one second, one second. If I could be good at anything, anything at all, instantly, I think. Would it be good at answering questions? Why is this taking so long? This is not a comprehensive video. But I was sitting here with students today and we were watching something. And while we were watching, I just thought, I want to do a video. I'm sorry. I truly am. I wanted to make a video about really quick ideas on helping students with special education needs or just needs in general that are, that like it doesn't fit into your budget, right? With funds lacking in education, I feel like special education students often get overlooked or they get pushed aside or we just pretend that there's not a need there in schools. And so there's just a number of things I've done over the last few years that I have helped. So this is not by any means like a list of exactly what you should do or all the stuff. It's a few things I thought about today that I wrote down that I hope help you. And my hope is that in the comment section below, you would add in like any ideas that you have that have helped your students with any sort of need that they might have it would be a really great place for people to look under here and, and find some more needs. Number one, I have this, well, let me show you. So behind my desk, I have all these, I have all this organized stuff over here. And in that are things that I use for students. In this box, weirder stuff. Silly putty, instead of just like regular, like everyone knows fidget spinners are completely annoying. But if students use silly putty, it's a really great way to, it's just like this little putty, I get it at the dollar store or five below. And it is a great thing for students to play with that's not loud. And if it gets hard and gross, they can just chuck it when they're done. But it's a really easy, simple kind of thing for students to play with instead of like clicking their pen or tapping stuff or whatever else. It's like a ninja fidget, trademarked. We also bought these little dinosaur things, put them on your finger, they're kind of ridiculous. But it's just like a thing you can just play with. And again, it's quiet. If it drops, it doesn't make noise or anything like that. And they're just kind of adorable and cheap. So when teenage kids make them all gross, then I can just get rid of them. Come in all shapes and sizes. Look, I'm not like a special education trained dude, but I know if I give a kid a ring and I tell him that it's magic and it will help you to stay focused on things in class, if you wear it, bam. And you're kind of blinging out with a little baby ring. 
The other one, weird stuff, this is like the original one and weirder stuff is usually next. That was anticlimactic. Um, I must have run out. I have like, I'll use like uh, pipe cleaners. Students can use, they like sit there and like wrap them around their pen or their pencil or just wrap them around their fingers. Those are also available at the dollar store. Glow sticks, which can be slightly distracting, I guess, because they glow, but um, it's just that kind of crackly stuff that you can do with it and it's nice. Doing stuff like putting Velcro on the bottom of students' desks. So I'll stick both sides of Velcro underneath and then they just, they can't, they don't peel them apart, but they can just feel it with their fingers. And sometimes that is just soothing to students that have sensory issues or sensory needs and no one knows they're doing it. So it's this kind of low key thing where it's under the desk where just you can feel it or under the seat where you can feel it. And that helps a lot too. Idea two. I also have a number of these stand up desks, which Snacks is uh, sort of showing us how it works. It's a desk, they stand up behind. How's that feel Snacks? Feels good, I can stand. <laughs> at a desk so yeah. that that's that this particular desk is an old lab table that I have that has two or four by fours like just posts that you buy them at Home Depot and I screwed them into the corner so I took the legs off and made it into a taller desk other stand-up desks that I have are the ones that you've seen in other videos the room is a mess right now so I'll show it to you but it's not where it normally goes because we were doing an activity. So this isn't where this desk usually goes. We were doing an activity in class, but it's just a plywood crate and the kids can sit inside of it if they want so that they can read, which is another thing that it's good for. Turns out, and I've said this in other videos, that when students can sit inside something like that, it cuts out all the external stimuli so they can really focus in on what they're doing. So whether you have like a little tent in your room or you have like a table that you can just put something around, uh, even if it's a curtain, it cuts out that external stimuli and kids feel safer. There's a reason little kids like forts and it's for the same reason because they feel safe and secure and they can focus in on what they're doing in class. And stand up desks just give kids that have a hard time like sitting still, like a place to like move around a little bit, a place to feel like they aren't confined to that seat that they have a really hard time staying still in. The alternative to a standing desk is well, I guess maybe I'm coining the term a sitting desk. So this is another lab table. This is a terrible shot, I'm really not. So what I did was I took a lab table that the school was getting rid of anyway. We got new lab tables and I cut the legs off so that it actually is just a coffee table, essentially. I put it in front of my ratty couch and the kids can sit there, they can sit on the floor, they can work on projects. But again, it gives kids an alternative to just sitting in a regular seat or just standing up. Now we can sit down also. I don't have money to go buy fancy flexible seating options. I do, however, have money to get a saw from Home Depot and chop the legs off of things so that all of a sudden a table becomes a coffee table and now kids can sit at it and it rules. Numero tres, set in the mood. So setting the mood, I, I like to, one, keep my lights pretty dim. Like I have all of my lights on now, but I generally never use all my lights, which is why I have all the lights over on my shelves, which is why I label my light switches to let kids know what the ugly light is to never ever turn it on because it makes the room all garish and bright. I find that if I just change the lighting, shift the shades on my windows, then it creates a much more calm vibe in my classroom. And that really helps a lot of students to just feel the room out differently, right? I'm not sure exactly what the science is behind it, but I know if you're just trying to chill and you have people over, like, Turning down the lights is interesting. There's a reason that candlelight is so romantic at dinners. But it's something about that lighting that just calms everything. Also, I went ahead and painted this wall blue. And this is the wall that most, like that's where our attention is most of the time. The rest of the room is this kind of like beige color, but the blue I did because it turns out that blue is calming to people. So painted it this light bluish gray color and it cost me like, 10 bucks for the cheap paint at Home Depot, which means you have to paint it like five times because I bought the cheap stuff because I'm a teacher and got a dream on a budget. Another thing that I found is that students are sort of, they long for consistency, right? So when you come in every day, there's no question as to what's happening that day. It's always up on the whiteboard or it's always up on the Promethean board. And it is a constant reminder of like every day I come in, I sit in the same seat, 
I can stand, I can sit, I can have my desk wherever I have it, and then look up at the board and see exactly what's going on that day and exactly how long each particular thing is going to take. So if there's a journal entry, it's already up there, you know that you need to grab your journal in the beginning of class. You then know that you have five minutes to complete the journal entry after the bell is rung. You also know that it needs to be a minimum of five to eight sentences. So in doing that, you're really taking children that are sometimes really unsure about what's going on in the day, what's happening at lunch, where they're going to sit, how they're going to get home, what's going on at home. And your day is immediately you're walking into my room, the lights are calm, the paint is calm, everything is sort of cleaned up and as neat as I can keep it. You know exactly what you need to do when you come in and exactly what's going to happen in that day. Just helps you rest assured instead of feeling like you're on some sort of like roller coaster of emotions all day. This is setting the stage for a nice, calm class. And sort of to that end, keeping everything in my lessons in like five to 10 minute chunks. If I have a class that has a lot of students with ADHD or they are anxious, it is these chunks of time that are not overwhelming, that I can say, all right, everybody, I need your attention for five minutes or we're doing this for 10 minutes, all right? I need, I need attention on me and you gotta lock it in for 10 minutes while we're um, doing this. And in doing that, it's like most kids can give you that. They can say five or 10 minute chunks or a two minute chunk, or I'm going to give directions and I need your attention for 20 seconds on me, 20 seconds on me right here. They know that there's an out. They know when this is over. They know when they're gonna to transition to something else. So even if it's something they're not particularly excited about, like independent reading, they can do it because they know that it's only 10, 12 minutes, whatever it is. And that seems to really help. Now, when we're doing independent reading, I find that it really helps to have books that kids actually care about and actually want to read and are on a number of different levels so kids can feel some success from whatever it is that they're reading. It's also important though for students with dyslexia or with uh, processing disorders to have something like a Kindle or an audiobook for students to listen to. And for those that are non-believers in that, I wanna say this, I once talked to a really good friend of mine who is a uh, specialist, she often has students listening to audiobooks. And I said, well, doesn't that like not really help them to read? So they're not like actually learning the fluency and what it's like to just really sit down with something and read. And she said, and what she said to me, like literally changed my view on this. She said, if you had a student who was blind or suffered with vision impairment and they used braille to read, would that not be appropriate because they weren't reading? And I thought that changed everything for me. So having audiobooks that students can either just listen to or they can listen to and read at the same time still helps them grow in vocabulary, still helps them grow in fluency, and still helps kids to feel empowered about who they are and what they're about and what their abilities are. Another idea for both keeping consistency in your classroom, and I realized just now I was numbering these and then I stopped numbering them. Let's call this number 97 or five. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I wasn't keeping count. There's a reason I teach English and not math. When students know where everything is, it just builds this sense of like having a sense where you are at home, where you know where things are, where you can count on, where you can find something. You're not looking around. You're not scatterbrained. You know where your notebook is. You know where the extra pens are. You know where the work is if you missed it. And so I love that idea because it's just empowering students. And so all of their notebooks get kept in class every day. They never have to go find them. They're in clearly marked bins with their period label on them. I also keep extra supplies in class so that no one ever has to leave. I don't want a student to feel like they can get out of doing work or that they can get out of what we're doing in the moment because they have to go run to their locker or they forgot something in their last class. So if you need a pen, I have a whole drawer full of pens. If you need extra paper, if you need an extra notebook, if you forgot your novel. Now look, there's space for students to leave the room that need to. If someone needs to take a walk, if they need a timeout, if they, whatever, whatever that moment is that they need, there's space for that. What I don't want students to do is try and get out of what we're doing by running to their locker, by running to another class. I want them to own the fact that you need a break go ahead and advocate for yourself and take a break. But when we're in class, don't feel like you need to leave to go get something. And also, it just helps for when kids feel dumb because they forgot their pen all the time or they always are losing stuff. It's like, I got you. I got a whole bunch of pens that I bought on sale in the beginning of the year. Don't sweat it. 
And that's it. That's my incomplete list of things that you can do for students with special needs when you're living on a budget. Because look, we're teachers. We're constantly perfecting the art of making something from nothing. We're always taking what we have and making it into something that is the best that we can for students. My ask of you is, before you go, is if you could go in the comment section and leave, what are some of the ideas that you use to help meet student needs that like, you know, you might be crunched on a budget or you just have like some really economical resources that folks that are watching this can go below, see what's going on there and get a little bit of help. You could also do that in the Facebook group over at Facebook, you go on Real Rap with Reynolds Teacher Talk. There's a closed Facebook group you can get into there also. And that's it, everyone. Really, listen, thanks so much for like all you do for kids. Like the fact that you're even watching this right now is a big deal because it means that your students are important to you, that you're taking time to like try and dive deep to figure out something, anything to help the students that you care about so much. That's a big deal. Don't forget it. That's it. Peace.